I've had people say to me that since we started working together, their dating goes better because they become I would have better. So. Uh, or in your case, sales. I mean, a lot of dating is sales. So uh, can you sell? <laughs> very, very similar. <laughs> um, the funnel is a bit different, but it, oh, yeah. the principles <laughs> are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if during a date uh, the person feels like they, they've hit a certain point in your sales funnel, that's a little creepy. <laughs> I've never kind of got, took it so far as, as thinking about it that way, but you could. You could definitely break it up it'd, into that. It'd be an interesting experiment. I'd be curious how it goes. <laughs> See, now you make me curious. Um, I don't now know who I'm... <laughs> You're improvising an entire scene in your head of what that date looks like, aren't you? <laughs> Welcome back to the Business Library. Today I have my, Milo Shapiro on. He's a public speaking coach. He's big into improv. So those are the two subjects we're going to cover in today's episode. With really also, how can you make your speech impactful, both when speaking, but also in day-to-day -day life? But I know that you started off in technology when we like first chatted. You mentioned that, and that caught me a bit off guard. Because I was like, <laughs> public speaking, like technology to public speaking, how, why? What's the first two questions that came to mind? Sure. I mean, I was an oddball in a cubicle doing my, my programming work. I was a computer programmer, COBOL, CICS, DB2, all stuff that there's very few jobs left in anymore in, in this year. But that's what I did for 15 years. That was my college major. Uh, but during that time that I, my day job paying the bills was being in IT, I discovered improvisation and I fell in love with it. It was so much fun. I was meeting great people, making terrific friends, discovering that my classes weren't full of wannabe actors. They were full of lawyers and accountants and, and people who wanted to have a creative outlet and also wanted that thing that improv gives to give them the edge at work, to be more quick on their feet, more responsive, come up with ideas better. And improv was teaching them that. So we were having a lot of fun. Uh, somewhere along the way in 1997, I think it was, there was this new thing coming out called Websites. And someone dropped by my cubicle and she said, hey, check out this website. It's a company, I think it was in Maryland, using improv for team building. Well, I stopped whatever I was coding at that moment and dove into that website. <laughs> and the website actually listed what games they use to teach things. We use this game to teach listening skills. We use this game. And I was looking, I was like, that game does teach listening skills. That game does teach building on each other's ideas. Well, that's not a good game for nonverbal communication. A better game would be, and I made a little list of what things I think should be on a team building course using improv. And then I stuck it in a drawer because who quits their IT job to go do something as crazy as that. But two years later, they offered us voluntary separation packages and, and it was a good package. And although it was the scariest thing I ever did, walking away from a really good job that paid very well, I decided this is going to be one of those things where if 30 years from now, if I don't do it, I'm always going to wonder what if, and I'm not going to want to start that company at 65. So. I took the package and I started my company, Improv Ventures, doing team building events with improv. And it was doing well and people were having fun with it. And people in the classes started saying to me, you should do this with bigger audiences, not just 10 to 15 to 20 in a team building, but like, like a motivational speaker. And long story short, because it's, it's a good story, but a long story short, I met someone who said they're right and showed me the way to a group called the National Speakers Association, where I learned how to create keynote programs, where I do get the audience playing games, but that's not the whole thing. It's within a speech about moving past the fear of failure and not worrying about if you make some mistakes and learning to take life a little more lightly so that we can achieve the brilliance instead of being stuck in, I don't wanna take a chance on failing, so I'll get nowhere. But I do get the whole audience playing the games. So that was my, my speaking thing, but that was supposed to be everything. Improv, that was my world. And then people started lingering after my speeches and asking me if I would help them with their speaking. And I'd had years in Toastmasters and now by then years in the National Speakers Association, but nobody had ever asked me to help them with their speaking. And I kept saying, no, I kept saying no. And one guy kind of begged me to, to do it. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, okay, let's see if this makes a difference. He was selling on the QVC network and they were gonna cut him for not selling enough because they said, you're not good on camera and people aren't buying your product. The QVC network, would yeah. that be like your, no, like, uh, what was those channels called? I can't even remember it. I know that's what we called them here in the States. I don't, I don't know for you, but, and I think QVC is international, but home shopping network, things like that. Uh, so he, he got back on the air after he and I worked together a few times and sold out his entire product line in five out of his seven minutes. They didn't know what to do with two minutes of dead air. And afterwards they said, what did you do? You were completely different on camera. 
He said, oh, I, I hired a speaking coach. So I thought, well, maybe I have something there. So I added it to the website, thinking maybe once in a while I'll pick up a coaching client. And SEO was so much easier back then that I shot to the top of the list of speaking coaches in San Diego. And now my business is probably 80% coaching, 15% speaking, 5% team building. But I'm fine with that, especially as I've gotten older. I think I, I serve myself better when I'm serving others. And helping people to be more effective with their speaking is a real joy for me. And it's so exciting to watch them go, everybody loved it or it really worked <laughs> or I wasn't scared because I felt confident by the time we'd worked together. And uh, it, it's, it's just been wonderful working with hundreds of people since 2004. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that feeling of teaching someone something and then coming back um, all proud and then you're way more proud. Uh, of, ah, I did it, I did it. I was like, <laughs> sometimes you don't even expect it. You're like, you actually, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think I'm more excited for them than they are for themselves. I, I've had clients send me the video of the speech and I'll watch it. I'll be like, I couldn't take my eyes off you. You did the thing we said and they're there with the voice and, and the pause in the right place and the words that we came up with. Uh, and then when you stumbled at one point, you ad libbed really well. I showed them how to do it because it's not about being perfect. It's about handling whatever comes up and doing it with grace. Uh, and so some of my best moments on stage have been handling a, a blunder well and the audience giving me credit for it in fact in one case an audience member came up to me and said i didn't believe that you didn't fool me i said didn't fool you what? he said you planned that so you could show that you handle that with grace i was like no 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 <laughs> I, would, I would never have had the engineer road load the wrong powerpoint just so that i could show you i could handle that situation with grace that never would have even crossed my mind but thank you that you had that confidence in me <laughs> i sometimes it just handling those situations it's the same when you mess up in a video it becomes even better because you messed up but if somebody told you to replicate it be pretty damn hard yeah because yeah. you you miss that the, the spontaneity whole flow. yeah sure i mean some of my favorite moments on saturday night live over the years is when the actors break if they did it every week it would get tired but when it's yeah. just because it's so funny, they can't control themselves. I've, I've watched the Debbie Downer skits where she cracks herself up over and over again. They always make me laugh. Yeah, it's that being who you are with an original, yeah. really. Being and human. going into, well, being that whippy, quick with your responses, like how do we go out and train that improv skill, really? Well... Yeah, that when, when people expect in a, in a matter of coaching sessions that they're going to get what I've had in 30 years of improv, it's not going to happen like that. <laughs> but I can at least expose them to the ideas. So I improv comes up for me in two different ways. One is sometimes I'm literally showing the person some exercises they can do to take them to, to their next level, especially people who are a little more reserved or don't know how to push their borders a little bit. What I say is if we can push ourselves out to a 10, in practice, then when you go out on stage and you slide back because you're not going to be that big and you slide back to a seven, I'm okay with that because you were at a four when we started. So it's about expanding that comfort zone of being a little bigger, a little more energetic. And, and we can do that with improv. The other thing that improv helps me with that's more behind the scenes is sometimes someone will do something and I'll say, what if instead we did it this way and I just improvise something? And I've had people look at me and go, how could you have just come up with that? That's just right. You're not even in my industry, but that was like right on as if you do what I do. Can, can you come in and just do that for me? No, no. I can't do that for you. Uh, but it, it, it's helped me to be able to come up with ideas on the spot because I do it on a weekly basis. Once you've sung a song that had never existed before 10 seconds ago, just coming up with a sales pitch for someone feels pretty easy by comparison. That's my 10 out to a seven. Hmm. Yeah, I, I never... Try to write a song. I imagine it's a lot more difficult than writing a sales pitch. Especially more... if a musician starts changing things in the middle, you're like, I guess I have to go that direction now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's well, tough. I, and it's grime while you're doing it to boot. I think I'm getting thrown out the studio pretty damn fast. <laughs> it's like, what, what, what did I do to bring this guy here? What, why is he here? I, I'll be asking them the same question. I don't know. Well, fortunately, in the business world, there's very few opportunities you need to burst into songs. So you're probably safe. Thankfully, thankfully. There's a reason why I, I quite quickly decided I'm not going to become a musician because I have absolutely no rhythmic sense at all. Uh, it doesn't exist within me. 
So, going into how do you actually improve a speech? Like, a where speech do you use the, what, the improv? Like, where do you use the improv within your speaking skill? It, it really depends on what the person's problem is. And that's one of the reasons that I love coaching as compared to teaching classes. Because different speeches need to be improved in different ways. And sometimes improv fits into that and sometimes it doesn't. If there isn't a logical flow of the material, if the person isn't balancing their stories and their data well, especially if it's just a data dump, data, 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 people get exhausted and tune you out. So it's not serving you. Uh, if the uh, if you've gone if you tried to make a point but you meandered at one point and so you lost the point, these are all places where I need to work with the person on the material and show them a better way. Sometimes that means scripting. Sometimes that just means helping them find the right bullet points so they can improvise themselves a little bit between the bullet points, but have a structure to come back to. Everybody works differently with that too. I, I literally had to tell one client, you should read your script. He did not work well from bullet points. Most of us can. He just shortened everything. He was gonna get through the speech in, in one minute because of the fact that he was, he was like saying as little about each bullet as he could. And I would remind him of the things we said. So I finally said to him, I think you should get up there and say, I am not a public speaker. You all know that. So to make sure I cover this well, I'm going to read this to you with my apologies. And then he read a really good speech and everybody was fine with it. Not a typical situation, but it served him better. Most people can work from bullets or just from their PowerPoints might remind them enough that they can do it. So that's the structure. If they've got that and what's poor is their speaking skills because they ramble, because they lose their place, because they don't use their voice effectively. I teach something called the seven variants of vocal variety. Everyone thinks vocal variety is just pitch and pitch is important. I mean, you don't want anyone talking like this for an entire speech, that would be awful. But, and then I get them. We've, uh, we've but, sat there, show, all of us. Yeah, and I show them how not to do it, but pitch is only one of the things that we can do with our voice and our speaking ability. So it's kind of like the old saying, if you give someone a hammer and that's the only tool they have, everything looks like a nail. And when they have to cut a board in half, they're going to hit it with the hammer until it breaks. That's not as effective as a saw. So I give them more tools to work with. And then we do play around with it. It, it I sort of improv, sort of not, almost more theater, playing with the tools to the point where they're like, oh, that would be a good place for this. Oh, could I do this? Here? Yes, you could. And once they know the tools, they can apply them to any speech they give. And that's when they start getting better. Yeah. Well, it's actually very, sim very similar to how you do in sales. You have different kind of tools, your pacing, your tonality, using pauses. You can do a bunch of different things, really. But as soon as you become aware of them and you kind of get an idea of how to use them, you start putting them into place and, and trialing and, them out. And you probably find that carries over into conversation. Your skill sets blend out elsewhere. I've had people say to me that since we started working together, their dating goes better because they become I would have better. Meant it so. uh, or in your case, sales. I mean, a lot of dating is sales. So uh, can you sell? <laughs> very, very similar. <laughs> um, the funnel is a bit different, but it, oh, yeah. the principles are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if during a date uh, the person feels like they, they've hit a certain point in your sales funnel, that's a little creepy. <laughs> I've never kind of got, took it so far as, as thinking about it that way, but you could. You could definitely break it up into that. It'd be an interesting experiment. I'd be curious how it goes. <laughs> See, now you make me curious. Um, I don't now know who I'm... <laughs> You're improvising an entire scene in your head of what that date looks like, aren't you? Oh, uh, I've... Uh, <sighs> Sometimes it's you can make it the you can have some fun with it if you if you play up that scenario. Um, yep. That helps, I think, for me with improv as well. It's kind of playing out different fun scenarios in my head, and then how would I react? Both thinking about how I would speak, how I would act with my body, all of these different kind of things. Sure. I'm in business 24 years now, and uh, because it, it, the coaching started in 04, but the business started in 2000. And I've, I mean, back then at least, I'd never taken a sales course. All of my sales training was improv. What might this person say about this? How would I feel if I was in this situation? Let's try this. That's not working. How would I switch gears? That's all improv. So improv was my training ground for starting my uh, 
my entrepreneurial life. I, I don't know how I could have done it without it. And I've had people request something and I, instead of just saying no to them, I'd say, that's not something I have experience in, but what I'm really hearing is these are your goals and you think it looks like this. What if we did this, which is totally in my comfort zone, that would meet those goals? Oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, we could do that. Well, now I'm not promising something I don't do and I'm meeting her needs even better because I understood, I was listening for what does she need, not what is what she, what does she say she wants? So often in business, people think they know what they want and what they really have is goals and intentions. Yep. You're so right in saying that. Uh, I can think of plenty of examples, uh, working in clothing and shoes, saying people, I don't want that color. They walk out with something in that specific color they say they didn't want. Like, well, how did that happen then? Yeah. The, the, the goal was to sell her the shirt that was that color. Now the shoes go with it. And yeah. she's happier than she was walking in looking for a different color. Exactly. So when it comes to delivering a speak or doing a podcast or talking to someone, one of the most important things to do is not make people fall asleep and lose attention. Definitely. So what, especially in like a speech, because that's like a long thing. Video is like 10 minutes. Podcast is back and forth. So you have some of the tools to, to utilize. How do you keep people's attention for 30 minutes without making them go to sleep, take yeah. a 10 minute nap, come back? There's a lot of different things that are built into there. And I've alluded to a few of them. One is you, you just can't hit them with all data. People can't absorb that much data. So people will listen to stories for hours and hours. People go to storytelling contests to hear stories. And so if behind each data, there's a little bit of a story to help people put things in context, they're more likely to go, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see that happening to you. Oh, no, what happened next? Oh, okay. Oh, because the result was because you bought this thing, you had this de opportunity. That, okay. And then move on to the next topic. So balancing those stories and data is a big part of it. Using your voice in interesting ways really makes a huge difference. Uh, being a little interactive if you can. I have, like I mentioned, I have two different programs. One of them is very interactive and the other one isn't. But I'm changing topics often enough in the one where I'm not interactive that I think there's always something to refresh them. It's, it's a top 10 list. The top 10 ways to not lose your audience is, is basically the nature of the speech. It's called public speaking at A's, not Z's, which is, you know, don't put your audience to sleep. That's the name of my book as well. So after they might feel like, oh, okay, I've heard enough from this guy on storytelling. Oh, now he's talking about ways you could alienate your audience. Oh, now he's talking about ways to use your body better. Oh, now he's talking about ways that handouts can be different. So I, I have enough variety in there that I think an hour kind of flies by for people. See, that's not what most people say when they've been to a speech. Yeah. Uh, most speeches are, well, it's, give it some 30 minutes of value and then what are we doing for the rest? Right. Oh, here's another one too. Um, if you know too much in advance, it's not interesting to listen to. So the first thing I make people stop doing is agendas. No one in history has ever been excited by or pulled into an agenda. Agendas are just plain dull. What, how horrible would it be if people didn't know everything you were going to say until you said it? Then there are surprises. So I teach people how to grab attention up front and then go into the next logical thing and the next logical thing. And the time flows by. And I don't think I've ever had somebody say, you didn't tell me what the 10 points you were going to cover in advance were. Guess what? At the end of the hour, you'll know what the 10 points are. Sit back and enjoy. And yeah. I've seen a lot of people resistant to it and they always come back and go, you were right. Cutting the agenda really helped. Yeah, that surprise helps. It really does. I think listening to the radio is a great example because if I set a good song on on my YouTube music playlist, it's a good song. But if that song comes on in the radio, I'm over the moon. <laughs> I, it, it means so much more because it's a surprise. Like I expect the song to come on if I press play. Sure. I mean, you think about sitcoms. I, I, I don't know if Friends is before your time, but it's such a classic. I, I remember. I've seen a little bit of it. Don't oh remember my goodness, a little bit. So yeah. Uh, I, but if at the beginning of each episode, one of the characters came out and said, so just so you know what's going to happen in this episode, Phoebe's going to oppress Joey with such and such, and, and, and Monica's going to say this to Chandler. Now let's watch the episode. You're like, why? I just saw it. Or previews. Movie previews make me crazy. Because there have been times I watch, I go, I got it. I don't see, need to see that movie anymore. I, I basically know what's going to happen in it. 
But if you just tell someone what what the beginning of the storyline is about, then then they will oh, tell me more. And that's the same with speeches. If you let them know what the speech is going to be about, that's enough, especially if they're a captive audience. If they're not going to leave for the next hour anyway, you got them. If, you, if there's a question of whether they'll stay, like it's an online thing, that could be different. You got to make sure that they know enough to know that they want to stick around. But once people's butts are in seats and they, they've committed to an hour, surprise them a little bit. Yeah. And I, I like you point out it's two very different environments, delivering yeah. something online and in person. It really is. Um, and one of the problems we run into is people say, you probably heard the phrase, oh, I hate PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint. I've well, heard my it before, theory yeah. is that there's three ways to use PowerPoint. You can use it well, you can use it poorly, or you could not use it. And most people opt for the middle one, unfortunately. Yep. So people hate PowerPoint. And I show them how to use PowerPoint really well so it's better than not using it. And I do that when I'm online as well. I always make sure that I can share screen. And I'm the little guy in the corner because no matter how good you are, it's really hard to be an interesting head talking into a camera for an hour. I can use my body more. I can be more excited. But the bottom line is I'm a head in a box. But with PowerPoint, <laughs> if I'm creating really good imagery in the right way, it's like I'm presenting the movie of all the things that I'm saying. And I use a ton of slides. Once you've paid for PowerPoint, extra slides don't cost you any more. Use more of them. So I, I remember one time I sent a woman uh, my slide deck and she said, do you know how long you're talking? And I said, it's an hour. She said, you sent me 88 slides. I said, yeah, that sounds about right. She goes, you can't cover 88 slides in an hour. I said, oh, you've never seen me in action. There'll be times I will go through four slides in a sentence. She said, I've, I've never seen anything like that. I said, yeah, trust me. And afterwards she said, you were right. There was always something new visually stimulating me while I was listening to you. I wasn't reading text. Someone told me I could submit three slides to a, for a 12 minute speech one time. I said, then I'd rather not. What, what could I put on three slides that are gonna sit there for four minutes each? That's worse than nothing. So he said, all right, well, do as many as you want. And I did about 40 in the 11 minutes. And he said, you're right, that was a lot better. And it's showing people how to do that. Yeah, so I, I really do like that approach thinking back to how many PowerPoints with pictures and images and text that I have just sit there and I've started to pick it apart. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for mistakes. Yeah. Um, especially if you like lose my interest for a few seconds, then I'm looking for the picture at the picture for the next 20 because I can or until you change it to the next one for two minutes, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's tough, especially when people say there are five things we're going to cover and they go to the next slide and there are the five things. And while they're talking about point one, what are we doing? We're reading two, three, four, and five. So we're not fully listening. We're not engaged. And then when he gets to number two, you feel like, oh, I already read that. Now you're only on number two. Now I'm bored. Why not just show them number one? Why show mm -hmm. them the others? We're not there yet. But that's one of the biggest mistakes people get is they get ahead of themselves. It's kind of like that agenda thing. If they see everything that's coming, they're going to be comforted. They're also going to be bored. Yep. Uh, I, I, I use a fill in the blank format when, I, when I'm live where there's lots of notes, but it's missing all the chunks that are really important. So they have to pay attention to fill in the blanks. Every once in a while, someone doesn't like it. Can't please everybody. But more often than not, what I hear from people is that kept me really engaged because I, I didn't want to miss any of the answers. You're, I love how many elements you bring into speaking. <laughs> with not just well, how you speak and yeah. different ways you can utilize that we've touched upon, but also you really find every element you can use in the room. Uh, I do. I, I try to, to appeal. Try to get my communications background, my business background, and my theater background to figure out in all cases, all those three sides of the triangle, which one is it that the person needs right now. Um, sometimes it's, it's about grabbing attention. Sometimes it's about getting to the point. Sometimes it's about the fact that the story isn't the right fit. And I sometimes have to break it to people. This isn't the right story for the speech you want to use, you know, break the hard news. Or, or a variation on that. One of my clients not too long ago he told this whole story and then he went into his points and I, I stopped him. I said, that story isn't making, what is the point you're wanting to get here, Rick? And he told me, I said, so the whole first four minutes of that story were unnecessary. You could have just said, so I was on a hike. We didn't have to know anything. <laughs> else 
And if the point you want to make is about facing the challenges that come along, that was in the middle of the story and you spent about four sentences on that. Tell me more about what went wrong on the hike. And that's and and when we rearranged it that way, he, he took it to work and they said afterwards that it was one of the best presentations he'd done. And he, he just needed someone to show him where he was a little, little bit lost. And most of us don't have any background in that. But I spent 20 years helping people with that, so I see it. Yeah, 20 years of working with something definitely teaches you a thing or two, I could I imagine. I, I, I can't mean, say it from my own experience. <laughs> I mean, I look back at some of the mistakes I made even four or five years into coaching, and I'm like, oh, I still can think back on people I'd love to call that I go, hey, remember back in, in 2006 when I told you such a – yeah, I don't agree with that anymore. Uh, I've come a long way too. Uh, my, my coaching's gotten better. I, I, one of the things I do now is the first appointment, I ask a ton more questions. I've created an entire assessment that I do with people as part of the first appointment. And the reason was that up until around 07, 08, sometimes I'd get three or four appointments in and then realize I'm on the wrong track with her. Oh my goodness. I need to re and so now by asking more questions up front, that doesn't happen anymore. So, you know, we all learn and grow in, in what we do. That's another I hope great still better in five years than I am now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's you would have to really try to go backwards or stay stationary. I get. Yeah. I think it's so much in our nature to want to progress somehow and feel that because if you feel like you're stationary, you these uh, my brain starts going cuckoo and, and making weird noises and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> It's how I feel when I have to give a class. I always feel like I'm taking eight steps backward because I can't find out enough about the people in the room to make sure that what I'm teaching is what that person needs to hear or what the majority of this room needs to hear. So when someone asks me a question four hours into the course, I was like, oh, that's what would be helpful to you. I can't undo the last four hours now. But if I had been one on one with her, that would have come up much sooner. So it. I always say to people, you know, even if you don't end up picking me, you know, may, maybe for whatever reason the fit isn't there or my pricing or whatever it is, do consider coaching because the growth factor is so much faster. Uh, are you familiar with Toastmasters? Yeah, we have. A, I've never been to one, but we have them over here. It's a lovely program if you have lots and lots of time on your hands to learn to be a better speaker. But I've had so many people say to me, I did Toastmasters for three years and I got more out of four sessions with you than I did out of all of it. I said, because you were working with the Toastmaster book that was written for everyone. It wasn't asking you about you. And you were getting feedback from people who'd been in the class in Toastmasters for maybe five, six months, not 20 years. So it's just, it's just not a fair comparison. And classes are worse than Toastmasters because if there's 30 people in there, do the math. You can't get more than a 30th of the teacher's attention. And it goes down from there during lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Or they put you in groups. Guess who you're getting feedback from then? People who, who came to the class because they're not good speakers. That's actually right. That's <laughs> actually right. Yeah. Well, it is, well, a shortcut. That's why you go out and you want to hire a coach. Yeah, Just you absolutely. don't want to spend 20 years in Toastmasters. <laughs> Unless you're going because you enjoy it. I had fun with Toastmasters, but uh, it was it was a slow way to learn, no question. As a closing question, I wanted to ask you about when it comes to a person's speaking skill or saying that it's not their skill, it's their fear. What's your answer to that question? Uh, fear is public speaking, the, uh, the terror and all of that. So the analogy I like to use if someone brings up scared, fear, nervous, those kind of words right off the bat, I say to them, Let's use an analogy. If I was your diving coach and you were needed to dive off the high board and you were on the end of the board and you were scared and you were wanting my help, I could come over at the side of the board and talk to you about breathing techniques, relaxation, visualizing success. But if there's no water in the pool, chances are nothing I say about relaxing is going to make you any less nervous about diving into blue concrete. So my job should <laughs> not be to help you through from here. My job should be to get you off that board and show you where the hose is, teach you how to turn the nozzle and show you how to fill up the pool. So by the time it's full up and you get back up on that board, maybe you have a little bit of butterflies in the tummy, but not much can go wrong because you're going to land in soft water no matter what. 
So what is putting the water in the pool of public speaking? It's showing people how to do those things I said, balance stories and data, use their voice, face and body more effectively, use humor. We didn't even get to talk about the power of humor and why that matters. All these things so that every week as they're working with me, their confidence is boosting because I'm direct. I mean, you've probably gotten that from this call. Um, I'll tell people when it's not good and then I'll tell people when it is. And when they start hearing more of the it is, sometimes I'll say, page one is great. We just need to work on part page two. Page one is great. Yeah, no, you're fine on that now. So now they feel good about it because someone who would tell them for truth, the truth, if page one wasn't good, has told them you're fine, move on. The confidence builds. And what I find is the fear goes away because they're getting better, not because we work on the fear. Once you know you're pretty good, there's nothing to be scared of anymore. And if you have a little bit of butterflies in the tummy, that's totally fine. We don't, I even wrote an article for LinkedIn called Don't Kill the Butterflies because you need that to draw energy from. So you want a little of that. I get that every time I'm standing in the wings and they're reading my intro. And I'm like, oh, there's you guys. Okay, channel it. You know, As long as the butterflies don't fly out my mouth, I'm okay. <laughs> yep. I like the analogy. Thanks. The butterf- it's, well, it's normal to be nervous before yep. doing something. And it's yep. just accepting what they're feeling. And, and, and the more prepared you are, the more you're in control of that. I mean, there are things that will have me nervous on stage that I'm out of control about. If my mic is cutting in and out, if the, I, there was one time the floor was so slippery that I was thinking more about not falling down than I was about my speech. These are things that are situational that, you know, that, that you try and find out things in advance that if you can. Uh, one time I, I asked her for a lavalier and she said there would be a lavalier for me. And then when I got on stage, I looked all over. I said, I. I don't see the lavalier. She goes, what are you talking about? It's right behind you. I said, this is called a lectern, not a lavalier. <laughs> and she said, oh, what's a lavalier? I said, it's a microphone that I can walk out into the audience. She said, oh, no, we don't have one of those. Well, suddenly at the last minute, all my interactive stuff was messed up because I couldn't leave the lectern. Uh, so I had to try and deal with that. On the, that, Those kind of things, yeah, they're going to cause nervousness. But if, if you've asked the right questions up front, and now I'm, my, my contract now says lavalier body microphone, so that uh, if the person doesn't know what lavalier is, it tells them. Somebody once said to me, you know that's redundant. I said, yes, I know it's redundant. Here's what happened one time with a lectern. So she's like, oh, now I get it. Uh, <laughs> well, it's so, a good story. Yeah. And we, uh, storytelling is how we connect with people. People who watch this video, hopefully, will remember me better because of some of the stories I shared. St- data is all processed in the left side of the brain, but stories traverse the brain back and forth as we try and process the information. So it's almost like leaving deeper footprints in the sand and, and it makes them last longer. So if you told somebody later on, hey, do you remember the story he told about uh, about just that? They'd go, oh yeah, and they'd remember the moral of the story because the story stuck in their head. Yeah. Well. How do we use humor? This is going to be the last question since oh, okay. you alluded to it. <laughs> since I alluded to it? I do believe it has a place in most programs. On rare occasion, I've been come to understand, no, we can't use humor here. But uh, one, one man called me up and he said, I've been all over your website. I like what I see about you as a coach. But I also see all this stuff about the improv guy. I'm going to be speaking about Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. There is no room for humor in this program. And I said, gotcha, which he took to mean, I agree. Gotcha was, I heard what you just said, but I'm not going to lose you over as a client over such a small point. So we rearranged his program because it was terrible. We redid his PowerPoint because it was awful. We worked with him on his expression and body language and all these different things. He kept getting better and better. And one day he came in and said, I'm really excited. I've been trying this out on my wife and my coworkers and they're liking it. I can't wait to hear what today's lesson. I said, good. Today's lesson is humor. (laughs) He said, you got to be kidding me because he was so clear that there was no room for humor. I said, so, John, you've trusted me this far. and I've never brought it up until now. And I can put it aside if you insist. But. How about this? We start with this basis. We are never, ever, ever going to use humor in a way that makes fun of people who have a horrible, debilitating disease that is going to kill them eventually. He said, okay. I said, good. That's a good baseline. Now that we've established that, are there some stereotypes about researchers we can poke fun at? Oh, yeah, we're kind of an odd bunch. Great. How about things we thought about Lou Gehrig's disease 60 years ago, and now we know so much more. It's kind of laughable where we were in 1960. And he went, Oh, you know, we used to believe, oh, 
I get it. We don't have to take ourselves so seriously as researchers, I said, as long as the understanding is that we're trying to accomplish something very important here. We found him four laughs in an hour, not exactly a stand-up comedy routine, but he wrote me from Australia where he was flying into and said, holy cow, people are saying it was the most entertaining speech in years. We have to have you back next year. You just got me another trip to Australia. I can't believe what a difference four jokes made. And I wrote back, three-day conference, how many other laughs were there? And he wrote back, not one. So when he debriefed and he came back, I said, here's what happened. 15 minutes in, you made them laugh and they thought, that was an anomaly. That's not going to happen again. And then 15 minutes later, you did it again. They were like, this guy's funny. And then you paid off not once more, but twice more in the second half. But more importantly, John, in the second half especially, what was going on between those laughs? He went, oh, they were paying better attention to see if I would do it again. I said, yeah. He said, thank you. I never would have dreamed four laughs would make that big of a difference, but they did. So people want to feel entertained. It's just the nature of the world in the 2020s. We're constantly expecting to be entertained. Every commercial is entertaining now whether it works or not, it's all trying to be because we don't, we won't withstand anything boring anymore. So humor helps with that. So that's kind of my, my overall view on humor and finding it. It's people say, well, I'm not funny. I was like, you made me laugh three times within this call yet already, probably. So I, I show them where they can be funny. And sometimes I just give them a line. I'll say something in the course of working and they'll, they'll laugh. I'm like, oh, you just laughed at what I said. What if you said that? You say it I'm like, yeah, it's funny. Put that in the speech. And so in the process of working back and forth, we find the humor in almost every topic. It's a great, as you mentioned, tool to grab attention. Yeah. And I, I thought would just a good point. I am the same believer. Every speech needs to be funny on some level. Yeah. Here and there. To keep, keep, keeps the attention. And that's the reason why yeah. people one of the reasons why people would actually listen. So if people want to know who Milo really is and really could get to connect with you, maybe hire you as a speaking coach, where can they connect with you, reach you? Sure. Sure. The best way to do it is to start with, if you can see it down here, for those of you who are on the video, not audio, publicdynamics.com. It'll tell you more about me and how I work. And there's a contact form there. And I'll be happy to get back to you wherever you are in the world. I work almost exclusively on Zoom now. Uh, you're not missing out on, on anything by Zooming. I'm Zooming with my San Diego clients now because I'm finding it's actually more effective than being in public, in person with them. Uh, we can edit things on the fly on screen by share screen instead of writing in the sides of margins. I've got all these teaching modules that I've created over the last few years since we went virtual that I can bring up at a moment's notice. I can't do that in person. And it's just so convenient. It works really well. And also, I find that when I teach people it here, it works great in the real world. If I teach them in person, it doesn't always transfer back to the times they need to be effective in virtual settings. So we get both birds with the one stone by working on, on Zoom in the first place. We will have that link down below. I, I can see it. Sure. I hope it's there. <laughs> well, it's also down below. If it okay. Good. People oh, you're can't saying, see it. It'll be there yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> so you can click it because I'm very, very lazy. Clicking and if you spell out something for me and tell me how to spell it i might not check it out just because i can't be bothered so i, I put it down because i know that's what i appreciate myself yeah and people will misspell dynamics sometimes i have to be careful with that i would if i could go back in time that's not what i would have chosen for my company name mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm on so many websites with it now that i don't want to mess with it <laughs>